Down the long path of history, tramping across centuries and continents and the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. <laughs> Tonight, the National Broadcasting Company presents the third in the new series, We Came This Way, a dramatic account of man's struggle down through the ages toward a democratic way of life. NBC has prepared a booklet to aid in your understanding and enjoyment of this series. Listen at the close of this evening's program for more information about it. Tonight, we are concerned with France and the way in which she was helped toward freedom by one of her greatest citizens. NBC presents Victor Hugo on... We came this way. Ladies and gentlemen, somehow, into the framework of time bounded by now and the next ringing of the chimes, and measured by the ticking of your living room clock, somehow into that scant space of time, we must fit a picture. A picture of a man and the shadow that man cast across the century in which he lived. Well then, the picture. No man exists in a vacuum. He is born into a family, lives among people, and has his being under a society or a government. If he's a little man, these things shape his destiny. If he's great, he may shape them. What we need now is the backdrop for our drama, a sketching in of people and events that weave the tapestry of France in 1841. And that's a job for you historians, but do it quickly. Minutes start escaping. The history of France in ten sentences, please. Young man, you can't hurry history. Maybe not, but you can historians. Now, what are the facts? Well, let's see. 1841. Hmm? King Louis-Philippe was on the throne of France. Started out being a pretty decent sort. They even called him the citizen king. What do you mean, uh, started out? Well, you know how kings are. Sometime they start out all right and then begin to get notions of grandeur. By 1841, the liberals had deserted him, and the left-wingers were sniping at him openly. What about science? Flourishing. And uh, business? Booming. And culture? What of that? Lots of it. A brilliant literature. The theater was active. And, uh, well, what about the feel of the people? Well, now there's something that wasn't so good. They began to sense that the government wasn't quite as liberal as it had started out. Uh, the people of Paris, particularly, who were always sensitive to such things, were restless. There's no open revolt or anything like that, but restless. That's important. Remember that. Well, young man, anything else? No, thank you, Mr. Historian. That does it nicely. Next! <laughs> Comes now the question of Hugo's heredity, the juggling of the genes and the chromosomes, the kind of people his parents were, the conditions of his childhood home. These things start a man on the way he must go. These, therefore, are facts we've got to know. Mr. Biographer? Yes, what is it? We need to know about Hugo's mother. Tell us briefly what facts you can. Why, easy. His mother was long descended on both sides from good peasant stock. Her home was in Nantes, and she had a good education. I see. Uh, what kind of a person was she? Uh, she was a brilliant woman who later in life had kings and generals for her devoted friends. She was smarter and better educated than her husband. Yes, uh, what about him? What of Hugo's father? Uh, he was a captain in Napoleon's army. Hmm, uh, what about their home life? Uh, does a marine in the South Pacific have a home life? Oh, uh, like that, was it? Uh, yes, of course. Captain Hugo was a professional soldier. Made a career of it. Hugo was his mother's boy. That'll explain a couple of things later on. Remember that. Well, are you finished with me? I think so. Well... Yes. Then, if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to the library. Go ahead, Mr. Biographer, and thanks for the information. Not at all, not at all. Now, where was I? I... Thus, Hugo's parents and his heritage. <laughs> Our interest is in Hugo as a leader of the people and a champion of the basic rights of men. But before he entered politics, 
or even thought of public life, he'd earned himself a fortune with his pen. The order of events goes something like this. He started writing poetry at the age of 12. Three years later, this entry appeared in his copybook. I am 15. I have done poorly. I will learn how to do better. In 1818, he was awarded both the first and second prize for poetry by the Literary Academy of Toulouse. At 25, he was the acknowledged literary leader of young France. And not content with success as a poet, Hugo turned to the theater. He wrote Hernani, which created a riot in French literary and theater circles. And is still read by more American college students than perhaps almost any other French play. Hugo went on to triumph after triumph. More plays. More poems. More novels. More money. More fame. And more friends. As a matter of fact, he was thrown out of his apartment by an irate landlady because so many people were tramping in and out at all hours of the day and night. In short then, gentlemen, here was a man standing on the threshold of his prime, full of life full with ideas, bursting with energy. And like Alexander, finding no more literary worlds to conquer. At 39, he had won them all. So the thing happened. Sooner or later, it had to happen. It happened now. Victor Hugo simply burst out of literature and into public life. It didn't happen all in a moment, but the idea had been growing on him, growing, and he couldn't shake it. In his apartment one evening, he said to some friends, but I tell you, the poet must be more than a maker of verses. He must be a teacher and a leader of public opinion, a priest and a seer for the people, a man of utopias, his feet upon the earth and his eyes turned skyward, looking always for better days. Hugo was off again at a wild gallop, happy now in the possession of a new goal to reach for, a new battlement to storm. His first campaign was successful, and in 1841, he was admitted to the sacred inner circle of the 40 old men of the National Academy. By now, he was a friend and confidant of King Louis Philippe, and many an evening he spent with that carpet-slippered old gentleman in his study at Versailles. And the king saw his wish and his power. And on April 13, 1845, the old man wrote a proclamation. In consideration of services rendered to the state by Viscount Hugo, we have decreed and do decree as follows, that the said Viscount Hugo, member of the Institute, be raised to the dignity of Peer of France. Hugo didn't know it then, but that day sealed his fate. It marked the end of a free career, where a man could say casually, I stand here on a current topic. Now he was a peer and responsible for the state. Hugo spent three years finding his political sea legs. Early in his career, in the Chamber of Peers, he said, I prefer not to belong to any political party. I intend to judge and support each in the degree to which it seems to be working for the interest of the country, in my opinion. One must be with all parties on their generous side and with none of them on their bad side. Noble sentiments, if not practical politics. Still, he felt his way along, working always toward a philosophy of government which was somewhere down inside him, waiting only for events to crystallize them. And the events were working, working as the quiet yeast works in the baker's dough. And the signs of the times etched themselves on the faces of the people of Paris. There were crop failures and no bread. There were more taxes and no money to pay them. There was need for goods and unemployment. There was need for strong government and no action. And finally one day, Hugo could stand it no longer. On that day, he arose in the chamber of peers and spoke. Chair recognizes Viscount Hugo. Ministers! Ministers! For seven years. Nearly eight years now, what have you done? Have you regulated finances? No. Uh, there are failures everywhere. There are floods. Have you regulated the food problem? Uh, no. Uh, there is famine. Uh, the July government suddenly becomes feeble, apologizing for doing nothing, without control over emotion and rumors in the public square. You are more fearsome of a riot than Napoleon of 20 battles. <laughs> As Hugo faces the assembly, he senses a mixture of response to his demands. And then, unprepared, without notes, he sounds the formula of all freedom-loving men everywhere. 
Without quite knowing it at the time, his politics crystallized then and there as he said, Ministers, gentlemen, we must turn ourselves to the people. The people, grave, calm, courageous, and patient, who work and suffer, and gradually, by a series of urgent reforms and improvements, create wealth out of their work and well-being out of their suffering. France is only the people of France. Hugo had found his way, had stated his creed, but the ministers didn't listen, and the Paris workmen grumbled in the streets, and the grumblings grew to demonstrations, and the demonstrations led to white-hot anger. And suddenly, on the morning of February 24th, 1848, there were barricades in the streets. Hugo's people had rebelled. The government tottered and fell, and the king abdicated. In the confused four months that followed, while a provisional government was feeling its way toward what the people of France wanted, Hugo roamed the streets of Paris, looking at faces, talking to workmen, trying to discover what was best for his people. And in that time, he said something very like the late President Roosevelt's famous statement in 1933. Hugo said, I do not understand why the people are feared. The sovereign people are all of us. To fear them is to fear oneself. In this moment of panic, I fear only those who are afraid. All right, let's forget now about parades and the people and see what went on behind the closed doors where the new government really didn't want a democracy. And so they hedged. But even so, popular pressure made them provide for the election of a president. And at this point, a new figure injected itself into the picture. Hugo had decided to move into less turbulent and more spacious quarters in the Rue de la Tour de la Verne in the west end of Paris. And one day, he was unpacking a trunk in a bare room in the new place when a short, dark man walked in unannounced and said, You are Victor Hugo, I believe? I am. And you? Mm. I am Prince Bonaparte, at your service. Oh, how do you do, sir? Do sit down. Yes, there is only this trunk here. As you see, we are just moving in. I'm quite all right. Shall we share the trunk? Thank you. I've heard of you, of course. My father served your uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte, for many years. And you, sir, could serve me. <laughs> well, that, at least, is to the point. What do you think I can do? You are, perhaps, the most influential single man in France. I intend to stand for election to the new presidency. I need your support. I see. And just what, Prince Bonaparte, do you think recommends you to my support? You know where I stand. I do. And that is why I'm here. They say I want to be Napoleon over again. That is mad. I am no genius. But I do want a chance to demonstrate my goodwill to my people of France. I don't want to be a guilty hero like my uncle. I would rather be known as a good citizen like Washington. Forgive me, Prince, but talk is cheap. You say thus and so. Now, what guarantees do I have at once president... You would keep your word. My dear Hugo, I believe in democracy with all my heart. In Italy, did I not fight beside the men of the rebellion? That is true. You have seen perhaps some of my pamphlets on the elimination of pauperism. With your support, we could return France to her old glory under the banner of freedom. God knows France needs someone who loves her at the head of her government. Well, Mr. Hugo, let me consider it. And if I am convinced of your sincerity, you shall have my support for the presidency of France. Hugo did give Bonaparte his support, and he was elected as first president of the Second Republic. This was in 1848, remember. The next three years were a nightmare for Hugo. Almost at once, he realized his hopes of the Republic could not materialize. Their leaders spoke of the people as the vile masses. For a time, Hugo placed some hope in the president, Bonaparte. But it finally became evident that Bonaparte, too, had a private axe to grind. All Hugo could do was to speak out bravely and bitingly against the government's usurping of the people's power. Then, on the night of December 1st, 1851, Bonaparte gave a great reception in the Elysee Palace. It was a brilliant affair and lasted until late. Then, when the last guest was gone, Bonaparte went to his study and got out a special dossier, labeled with the single word, Rubicon. He looked at it long and then broke the seal.
What in heaven's name is the matter? Hugo, come at once. The Republic has been made prisoner. Yes, come Hugo. in, He'll come, come in, men, and that, stop babbling. That is right, Hugo. Bonaparte has taken over the government. But I don't understand. How? The army, Hugo. It is everywhere. The Palais Bourbon is surrounded. The Chamber of Deputies is barricaded. They say that 70 of the representatives have already been made prisoners. Why? This means dictatorship. I'm afraid so. Some of the leftists have not yet been captured. And they're meeting in an hour at number 16, Rue Blanche. Will you join us there, Hugo? To what end? Oh, to stop this awful thing if we can. Will you come? Of course I'll come. Excuse me a moment. Sir. I must tell my wife. Sir. Adele. 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 What is it, Hugo? Something wrong? I'm afraid so, my dear. Bonaparte has seized the government. The representatives are all being arrested. Oh, darling. I must leave at once before they come here. But, Victor, you'll be... Now, now, don't you worry about me. I'll be all right. Here is some money, darling. It isn't much, 900 francs, but it's all I have in the house at the moment. Now, don't worry, and I'll get in touch with you just the minute I can. But if the soldiers come here, what shall I do? Nothing. They will not molest you. It's me they're interested in. And you, Hugo? What are you going to do? I am going to do my duty. Do it, darling. And God bless you. There must be something that we can do. Everything is in the hands of the army. What can we do? Can't we go to the Chamber of Deputies and invoke the Constitution? We can't get in the chamber. Even the streets leading to it are jammed with soldiers, and any one of us will be recognized and seized. Uh, let's hear from Hugo. Yes, yes. let yes. Hugo speak. Yes, let Hugo speak. All right, Hugo, what do you think we ought to do? Do? Why, do everything. Yes, right. We must resist this seizure of power. We must arouse the people. They are the ones whose liberty has been stolen. They are the ones who will fight for its return. Right, right, General. And we'll march on the palace. If the troops yield, we'll seize Bonaparte. Good. If the troops fire, scatter at once, all over Paris. And call the people to arms. Sound the toxin. To the barricade. Yes. Yes. Oh, there is our work cut out for us. There. The soldiers are coming. Leave at once. What? what? But someone must have told of our meeting place. Men, to your work. We will meet at midnight tonight. Where? In the back room of the Cafe de Ville. Go now and speak out for France. How can a baker argue with a mercenary? A loaf of bread is no answer to a naked bayonet. An honest carpenter lugging his toolbox to work in the freshness of the morning stands dumb and unbelieving at the sight of a musket muzzle. It was always so. The good people mind their own business and bake their bread and saw their planks and stare at first in shocked surprise in the face of naked, grasping force. The people are slow to anger. And in that interval of unbelief, dictators move in. The trap snaps shut. So it was in Poland, if you will remember, when the nation was raped while the world watched, stunned. And so it was in Paris on this 2nd of December on a biting leaden morning in 1851. The next 70 hours for Hugo merged into a nightmare of frenzied speeches, calling the people to arms, secret meetings in back rooms, running always from the soldiers a price on his head. At first it was heartbreaking. The people seemed stunned. Slowly, the people of Paris began to rally behind Hugo and his committee. Barricades began to appear in the squares and on the boulevards. The people grew bolder. And then the incredible happened. It was on the fourth day of December when the dictator ordered 80,000 troops into the city. They came in three columns, converging on the center of Paris. After a sleepless night, during which he'd attended meetings and written manifestos, Hugo was standing on the curb, hidden in the crowd at the old Saint-Denis gate, where a handful of workmen manned a barricade facing the oncoming column of troops. The curbs were lined with people, watching to see what would happen. Suddenly a shot was fired, and the soldiers went mad. Hugo, the troops, they're firing into the crowd, run for it. I can't run. I can't believe my eyes. It's horrible. I can't stand it. Look, they're bringing cannon to bed on the crowd. Wait, wait. It's all good. This is massacre.
the people's back was broken and another dictator was in power. Hugo was a hunted man with a price on his head. Nine days later, a workman with a tin lunch bucket walked into the Gare du Nord and bought a ticket for Brussels. And thus it was that Victor Hugo began an exile that was to last for 19 years. But Hugo was no placid soul, contempt to accept the inevitable. Within him burned the divine fire that would not let him stop or rest until his beloved France was free. To a group of exiles in Brussels, he said, I tell you, there can be no peace while Bonaparte rules France. It is war to the death between him and me. I shall not rest until Frenchmen can once more be free. How long? Who knows? One year or ten, it doesn't matter. But be very sure, his doom will come. And until that time, I have no task but to hasten the day. And I vow to you here, I shall never step foot inside France until France again is free. And beyond that, I can see a large peace someday under the United States of Europe. And so for the next 10 years, burning indictments streamed from Hugo's pen. First from Brussels, and later from the islands of Jersey and Guernsey came bolt after bolt, hurled at the head of the traitor Bonaparte. First came the burning story of a crime, written in the white heat of hate. Next came the contemptuous Napoleon the Little, more telling because the writer was less angry. Then came a cold-blooded attack, 6,000 epic lines of hate in a book called The Chastisement that rocked Bonaparte on his throne. Next came The Legend of the Centuries, a more temperate work but still leveled at his old enemy. And finally, his most magnificent work of all, Les Miserables. This tremendous study of Jean Valjean, the released convict, deals with what Hugo called the threefold problem of the century. The degradation of man into proletarian, the decline and fall of women through hunger, and the destruction of children into a social outer darkness. This impressive social document is nearly always listed among the hundred best novels of all time and sold over seven million copies in the first 40 years. During this period, too, Hugo was a nerve center for every liberal movement in the world. Mazzini calls for help, and he dashes off an appeal to the Italians. Poland is in trouble, and Hugo intercedes. John Brown is sentenced for the affair at Harper's Ferry, and Hugo writes to Lincoln. Everywhere, it seems, his great spirit was at work in the world. And then his long prediction came to pass. Bonaparte was tottering before the onslaught of the Germans. On September 4th, 1870, Bonaparte yielded his sword at Sedan, and Hugo was called to Paris. Only now, with the dictator gone, would he consent to return to his beloved France. As the train pulled into the station from which he had fled in disguise 19 years earlier, Paris, torn by siege as it was, stopped everything to give its hero a welcome such as few men ever received. Over 10,000 people jammed the station, and as he stepped off the train, there was a deafening cheer for their hero. What happened next is a matter of history. So, suppose we call on our historian friend to tell us about it. Well, I wondered if you're going to forget me. Well, let's see. Now, 1871. Hugo called that the terrible year. They called him to the government. Of course, he accepted. Tried his best to hold out for a decent peace with Germany. But the businessmen couldn't wait. And they voted him down and made what he called a shameful peace. So he resigned his post in protest and incidentally took himself off to Brussels again in voluntary exile. And how long did his exile last this time? Two years, approximately, most of which time he spent in Luxembourg. All right. And that brings him back to Paris and another election into the Chamber of Deputies in the Third Republic, the republic nobody wanted. And almost single-handed over a period of six years, he fought, heckled, championed, voted back nearly all of the civil rights Frenchmen had been without since 1850. Hugo lived on, vigorous to the last, and finally, as all men must, died quietly on May 22nd, 1885, at the age of 83. This, then, is the portrait of a man. Not of a poet. We haven't time for that. Not of a father, husband, or a lover. And that, too, is a tale to tell. Not the novelist or the playwright or the great humanitarian, but only of the statesman. And now, our portrait's finished. How shall we sum it up? 
His contemporaries called him... A dreamer. An amateur politician. A poet in the Senate. A soft-hearted visionary. Strange, it's hard to recall the name of a single one of those contemporaries. But Hugo loved his people, had faith in the common man, and looked at the time when there should be peace among all free men. He preached that impractical doctrine a hundred years ago. And men from 50 countries sat together in San Francisco last month to make of that doctrine a reality. Because Victor Hugo believed that a poet must be a prophet for his people, we came this way. Would you like to know more of the life and times of Victor Hugo portrayed in the program you've just heard? A handbook containing life stories of 13 great leaders in the struggle for human liberty has been prepared as an interesting supplement to the broadcast series. To obtain your copy, write for We Came This Way. Address your request to Columbia University Press, Station J, New York 27, New York. And enclose 25 cents in coin to cover costs of printing and mailing. script was written and produced by Albert Cruz. Original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and conducted by Joseph Galicchio. Members of the cast included Mr. Clifton Utley as narrator, Mr. Wilms Herbert as Hugo, Miss Geraldine Kay as Adele Hugo, and Mr. William Everett, Mr. Tom Post, Mr. John Holtman, Mr. Fred Sullivan, and Mr. Gilbert Ferguson. This series is presented each week as a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. National Broadcasting Company.